Good evening. I'm Stan Grant. Welcome to Q&A from the Gama Festival in northeast Arnhem Land, where traditional culture meets contemporary political debate. Tonight we gather on Yungu land and we are guests of the Gumach clan and very grateful to be here. Today the Prime Minister and the opposition leader came to Gama, but there was no firm commitment to the Indigenous calls for treaty or national Indigenous voice in the Constitution. Well, here to answer your questions about that and other issues tonight is the founder of the Cape York Partnership, Noel Pearson, Indigenous Affairs Minister Nigel Scullion, Gama Festival Director Denise Bowden, local Yongu Elder Japari Munangirich, Kimberley Indigenous Leader and Head of Nyamba Buru Yauru, PDU, and Professor of Indigenous Studies at Melbourne University, Marcia Langton. Please welcome our panel. Here tonight in the audience as well, we have traditional owners, local Yongu community members and visitors to the Gama Festival. And our first question tonight comes from Mirkiowu Ganambar Stubbs. Um, Yongu Ganambar Minister, Prime Minister Ganambar Malcolm Turnbull Nangai, Yongu Kuru Urawaga, opening a in the way addressing crowd night. Tiel karmangur yulgo koro yulgo matta koro ka bukmak to guni darangan jamar kuli ka ngala palmire. I was very inspired to hear our prime minister speak to the crowd in my language, in an, a language so ancient of on earth, particularly in this country of ours. I must have been, it must have been really daunting for him. His um, pronunciations was excellent. <laughs> but a question to you, Mr. Scullion. Do you know of any non-Indigenous bureaucrats in either federal or state department of the Indigenous Affairs who are fluent in an Indigenous language? Do you think more should be done to encourage such people to learn. Thanks very much and thank you so much for your work in looking after our Jamakuli and our future. I really appreciate that. Um, look, the answer I think off the top of my head is probably no, not fluently, but perhaps I haven't bumped into them yet. Uh, but I will say uh, uh, I have probably more than 60% of my staff are Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people, not because that's a selection, because they're just very, very good at what they do. But can I say um, language, country, people, culture is the package. It, you can't pull one apart without the other. And I was thinking this morning as we are talking about um, the recognition of our first people and that's how that process started. Uh, a, a, a voice in the Constitution. We wouldn't be concerned about how that would go with the Australian people if 10 years ago students were learning a language uh, where they lived. They were learning about the culture of our first Australians. They were learning about the real history of dispossession. They were learning about a culture that, frankly, I don't think many know, people know about, and I'm delighted to see some new literature coming out uh, uh, around that area and some discussions around that area and I've had some uh, conversations and I, I, I suspect uh, Marsha may be a uh, better place to talk about the future in that regard. I've asked her to do some work for us. Uh, but you're absolutely right, you know, you, you can't, how can you reconcile with what we've taken away unless you understand exactly what that is and I think had we been in that position we'd be in a lot easier. Australia. I don't think would have quite the challenges with the leap that they may be asked to make. Badra Wiradjuri Gibi, Adira Maralinia, Badu Wiradjuri. Language is important to us. It's important that I can speak Wiradjuri language, not as well as I would like, but my father has helped keep, keep that language alive. And I want to see, ask you, Jabri, how important it was for you to hear the Prime Minister speak in Yongu Mother. I was pretty amazed with how the Yongu word spoken by the Prime Minister, which gave an understanding to the Yolo 
in a, in such a way that it actually in amongst the audience that would say, I wish I knew how to speak Yolngumata. Mm. Mm. Noel Pearson, you, you've written about the importance of language. I know you've written about the importance of politicians being able to speak that language, in particular Best Price in the Northern Territory. What does language mean and what does it say to be able to speak our languages, as we were reminded by Gullery and Upingu, Gumach leader, Australian words? Yeah. The country has never formally recognised the existence of these Australian languages. Um, in 2011, when the expert panel uh, considered constitutional reform proposals, um, I had hoped that a proposal for constitutional recognition of Australia's original languages would be one proposition that might be put to the Australian people. Unfortunately, the polling done at the time was sadly quite negative about that concept. And uh, I was very dismayed. I was the main advocate for that idea um, that we must first formally recognise the existence of these languages and provide support for their preservation and continuation and survival. Many of these languages in Australia are extremely precarious and will be lost to the planet if we don't provide for their safety and growth and con continuity. So I'm hoping that part of the um, agenda going forward will be for us to revisit this question of uh, formal recognition of Australia's original languages because there's such a fundamental part of the heritage of our nation. Our next question from Suzanne Thompson. In May <coughs> this year, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people came together at Uluru, the culmination of which was the call for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to have a legitimate voice about our affairs and our future destiny and the establishment of a Truth and Makarata Commission. With respect to comments made from politicians yourself included, Minister Scullion, that indicated fear amongst politicians and parliamentarians, we, the Uluru Statement Work Group, ask, if uniting the future of Australia for a common destiny, bringing all Australia together is the goal, what is there to be fearful of? <laughs> Nigel, you sit in the National Party party room and it was the National Party leader, Barnaby Joyce, who was almost first out of the gate to talk about the, the voice in the Constitution being a third chamber of the Parliament, precisely the sort of fear-mongering or scare campaign that is, that, is, uh, that is in that question. Well, can I say the most important thing in this process is to be fair dinkum. I was being fair dinkum. There are a number of my colleagues, and I'm sure an awful lot of Australians, who are saying, wow, what's all this about? You've got to be fair dinkum if we're going to move forward in this. You've got to call it out for what it is. And it's not mischief. Um, it's just not where people are at at the moment. And I was saying that in the context of, look, yes, some people have come out and said this is the case. And I've just sort of said, well, look, just take a chill pill. We've got to listen. We've got to, we've got to actually see exactly what's being proposed. And we need to, in a careful way, ensure uh, that we consider this process properly. Uh, and I think it's quite a legitimate uh, uh, response. And I think it's really important because there are so many ways this can get off the rails and not many ways it can stay on. I'm very confident we can keep this on the rails. We've got to be fair dinkum. We've got to take everyone with us. Uh, and that's really important, whether it's my colleagues uh, uh, or my, and I say my colleagues in this context. I talk about all of my parliamentary colleagues. We're all on the same side about this. There aren't not much politics being played in this and I hope that that remains the case. Su Suzanne, are you happy with that answer? You're not? I suppose it's more of a human question of, so what is the fear? This is about, you talked about fear, what are they fearful of, well, well, is fearful, what I want to know. Well, like most fear, it's based on the unknown. So the notion that we would have a voice 
with not a lot of detail around that for a lot of people. And so, uh, so Mr. Joyce said, "Oh, that's another, uh, you know, an, another part of Parliament. It'll be a was he being fair income? You, part you of said Parliament? No, I said he was reflecting a fear, uh, and so uh, that's why, uh, you know, if it's unknown, people don't know about it. I mean, do you think? Perhaps I can ask you the question. Do you think people should believe exactly what you believe? Do you think people should be where you? Are? You've lived this. This man's lived this. He's close to this. You are not fearful of these things. But there are plenty of Australians and my colleagues and people around the table well, that are in different places. Well, Su Suzanne, just to ask, ask the question and uh, yeah. not have to answer, but yeah. I'll, I'll go, go to Peter. I know no one wants to say something as well. Peter, you? I, I think it's a, a very uh, core question, central question, because um, fundamentally what it, what it comes down to at the end of the day in politics is, um, is the votes, the constituents, the numbers. And we uh, know that we uh, live in a, a conservative society but I think when it comes to the kind of uh, policy reform issues dealing with Australia's first peoples, you might have to ask yourself this question. The incrementalist nature of politics in the way that it's dealt with a gradual way of responding to the kind of outstanding and obvious and evidence needs of our community, that is it also a question of mistrust uh, between the political elite and the broader community, uh, as opposed to a degree of the nature of the conservatism that might also exist in our community. So there may well be fatigue in some in the Australian community, and they may well, the community might well respond very constructively and positively if there was that sense of unity of purpose uh, for the uh, developing maturation of the nation, uh, because it is in the, in the national interest, that um, we do uh, take a stand, and I think the the, uh, the comments by uh, Galleroy, the leader here, and uh, many others who've spoken about uh, the courage, really, uh, between our political leaders, fundamentally uh, is underpinned by the nature of uh, that courage and trust combined. And I think that we might well see the Australian Rep um, public respond in a much more constructive manner in terms of trying to rectify, because the piecemeal nature in which we deal with Aboriginal affairs, excuse me, over the years has probably caused to some effect the nature of the cynicism and the nature of the opposition. Noel, today you said that you follow the lead of Galloway Unipingu in putting the trust in the Prime Minister. Do you have a faith in the courage of political leaders to stare down a fear campaign? Um, I'm hoping that's going to be the case. It has to be the case. We will never succeed unless our leaders step up to the plate and conjure the better angels in all of us. Can I say in relation to the National Party, though, that I've been around the... trawling around the Commonwealth Parliament and I've knocked on every Conservative's door and our biggest supporters come from the National Party. They're better than the others. They're better than the Liberals. They're better than Labor. The National Party people are the most responsive to the idea of the voice. I've knocked around with people like Bob Catter, Ron Boswell in Queensland. These are all National Party people. They lived with blackfellas. They know blackfellas. And they're highly sympathetic to our cause. So I was disappointed in Barnaby Joyce's um, knee-jerk reaction on that Monday after the um, Uluru statement from the heart. But I have not at all given up on our main constituency. It is those people out in the regions and in the remote areas who've lived, gone to school with blackfellas, who are most sympathetic with our constitutional reform ideas. Marcia Langton, we'll go back to the, the, the point of the question, I think, and that is where does, in your mind, this fear come from? I think the fear is that um, our, the, rec the recognition of our peoples brings into question their status as Australians. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, shaking up the very foundations of what they believe Australia is. People who are opposed to the proposition believe Australia is a white country and they don't want to admit how they obtained this country. 
it's ironic, isn't it, that I think there are three or four people whose status as Australians has been called into question under Section 44 of the Constitution. Um, two or three senators on the Greens side have had to resign from Parliament. Uh, somebody else is in court over it. Canavan is, has had to stand down, is that correct? No, it will stand down from the Cabinet, but awaiting High Court action. So min the Minister for Resources, Canavan, has had to stand down from Cabinet and is waiting for clarification. There are others in the Parliament whose uh, Australian citizenship is in question because of uh, dual citizenship issues, where they were born and so on. So it turns out that quite a few members of our Parliament aren't in fact Australians under the Constitution. And uh, <laughs> you watch, they will, they will put up an amend amendment to section 44 to clarify their status as Australians before they deal with ours. Mm. Thank you, Marcia. <laughs> next, next question from Richard Weston. G'day everyone. Truth telling is fundamental to achieving Makarata or healing for this nation. Is Australia ready for truth telling? Thank you. I, I want to go um, to you on this, Denise Bowden. We're hearing the word Makarata and we're Makarata as it's probably more commonly known. Um, what is it? What does it translate to? What would be achieved? So in this region, Makarata was a form of uh, resolution settlement. Uh, perhaps you might have uh, clans that, that may have had some form of dispute, an intermediate from another clan would be introduced uh, to find uh, peace. So uh, perhaps uh, it may be um, in the form of a spear to the leg, so that blood would be spilt and toxins would flow and there would be a cleansing type of ceremony. Um, once that discipline had been enforced, then the, the, the slate had been cleaned and therefore it's back to business. Um, I think it's a, an incredibly interesting concept. I think it's completely relevant in contemporary Australia. I'm sitting here looking at all of these children here in front of us and I feel as if this is a conversation that shouldn't be happening in the next 20 years in your lifetime. Uh, we do need to move forward as, uh, as a nation together in unity. This is a, a very sensible discussion, a very sensitive discussion we all have to have together and it can't be used as a political football. Hmm. Uh, Jumpery, part of, of that question went to the, the issue of truth-telling. Part of that truth-telling is telling our history. We're on Gumach land, we're among Yolngu people. What is the history that is untold here, the truth of what has happened here on this ground? The, the history that has been untold in the community, but to the younger generation that have never been told. And there is a reason for it. The uh, reason is that Makarata, the word itself, has a very deep, meaningful layers of truth. In asking a question about Makarata, and being Makarata, the word, now on the spotlight in the arena of parliament, it is a we are working on a, as a nation, in making things happen that what we see as indigenous people is also known in the Western world. It is about, to my understanding, making an agreement. How can we become blood brothers when we still have the differences? And, and what about the, the, the painful part of that history? Um, we've heard talk today about uh, the, the frontier wars, the conflicts that have taken place here. What about the painful part 
of that history in confronting that juppery that happened on, on this land? We have heard um, a lot of that happenings, um, but also hearing from the elders about the poisoning of water during the time of when there were ceremonies held right across Arnhem Land, uh, not only in Arnhem Land, but right across Australia. Um, I know it's a painful to talk about it today, but we as people can resolve what has been in the past so that when we do that, our younger generations can prosper and see a bright future. Our next question from Jackie Troy. Naya Namichmitong, Naya Narigu. I'm of the Namich clan, of the Narigu people of southeastern Australia, the Snowy Mountains. I'm way off country, but it's wonderful to be up here. Thank you for having me in your country. So, Dr. G. Yunapingu gave the world his beautiful language, Ungamata, through his song. And this country gave him an early death because he was different. Gama is about settling our differences. How is it that in this country today, someone like Dr. G could die an early death because of discrimination? And what do you think this country can do to stop this and settle our differences? Well, of course, we've part of Gama this year has been paying respect to Dr Yunapingu and his extraordinary contribution to Australia. I recall the words just the other day that he died not knowing his place in his own country. And that's what this discussion has been about, place in country. Uh, Peter, you, I, I want to go to you on the question of racial discrimination because it goes to the issue that we've been discussing here and that is constitutional reform part of the discussion process has been looking at those elements of the Constitution that specifically address race and even the potential for some form of anti-racial discrimination clause in the Constitution. Peter? Uh, yeah, thanks, Dan. I think um, people of the Northern Territory particularly uh, would be interested and concerned to, to consider the nature of the proposed amendments and the final propositions that might arise that in respect to the uh, clauses that deal with uh, the um, anti-discrimination. I think there's, uh, there's particularly two. One is to do away uh, with the, uh, uh, the notion of race, but to uh, consider, in, certainly in the uh, expert panel's report, to deal with the uh, question of uh, making laws um, for the benefit, benefit and purpose uh, and well-being of Aboriginal people and also to have a general course of anti-discrimination. Now, uh, I'm not a lawyer, but there are obviously hu hugely complex issues, but uh, it, it's something that uh, obviously affects um, many, uh, if not most, Aboriginal people. Um, not only Aboriginal people, though I guess we see the broader community with the, with the immigration and the refugee uh, debate and discussion that happens in this country. Um, it's a... Uh, um, I think there's two sides of it, I suppose. One is that we need to look at um, what didn't happen post-1967 in respect to the referendum. Uh, we need to look at, uh, from a uh, constitutional point of view, in terms of uh, how do we get the parliament to make uh, to work better for our interests and for the interests of all Australians. Uh, and thirdly, what are the particular kinds of amendments uh, to the constitution that we need to consider that would um, give the parliament the power. There are certain propositions and the Referendum Council has made its report on it and there has been, uh, there's no silver bullet or panacea to it. A lot of it is, uh, Marcia raised the question of the, the notion of insecurity um, and the fact that we, uh, uh, there is uh, uh, this level of fear in respect to change that the uh, minister has mentioned as well too. They're all part of the, the whole uh, concern that we have in respect to uh, racial discrimination. But I think they need, there's no one answer. One question clearly is the success of 
uh, whatever, whatever the final propositions are that will be put to the Australian public subject to whatever the parliament decides and how that's negotiated. Uh, the prospect has been raised uh, over the last couple of days uh, by the opposition leader in terms of a select committee with the, with the government uh, involving Aboriginal people. And I know the um, Referendum Council's report, uh, while putting forward its, its recommendations, uh, certainly uh, indicated that there, there would be um, the, the, the additional kind of consultation. So it might well be an mm. opportune time to uh, use that invitation to be able to look at uh, how these particular matters can be dealt with leading up to the Constitution. But that's not going to change things overnight. I think that's the problem uh, that we're all faced with. It's not necessarily going to change things immediately. Discrimination, it, but it requires, in my view, the very strong political leadership that this uh, Gama Festival and the leaders here have been calling for. I think if at every opportunity we need to be, uh, whether it's the AFL, whether it's a, it's a matter in the, uh, on the field or off the field, there's got to be a level of consistency where we have to call out the racist behaviour. And we have to stand and we have to be able to encourage and invite the Australian public to stand with us in that. But first and foremost, it requires our political leaders to respond mm. on every occasion. I, I want to go to Noel Pearson on this, because Noel, you've been part of this decade-long process and it's looked at a whole range of proposals Race does sit in our constitution. At various times you've been a proponent for an anti-racial discrimination clause in the constitution, but your thinking has moved on. Explain where you're at right now and how comfortable you would be living with race still in the constitution and how that would be negated by the proposal currently before the parliament. Well, you're right about my advocacy for uh, protection against racial discrimination. We put a proposition to the expert panel back in 2011 to insert a provision that would outlaw racial discrimination against anybody, not just Indigenous people. Um, that met with a very consistent opposition that would completely disable any chance of getting constitutional recognition. That was absolutely plain. Um, I then diverted my thinking away from a non-discrimination protection to advocating for a political voice. Because if you can't rely on the High Court to protect you from discrimination, then you might have to rely on your own voice to point out when discrimination is taking place and take a political stand in the democratic process to um, disinfect any legislation of discriminatory provisions. So that's the story about the racial discrimination one. The question about the use of the word race, I was also very persuaded that the race power so-called, um, that we should change the, the words from race to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples or Indigenous peoples. Um, I have to say, in relation to this one, the conflicting kind of feeling that I have is that that was the 1967 achievement. The race power is the achievement of 1967. And so I, I've come around to the view that um, if we were to banish um, Section 5126, we would, in effect, be pressing delete on the 1967 achievement. But in relation to Dr G, I have to say the late uh, Kimberley politician, Indigenous politician Ernie Bridge said, we have a national crisis looming on metabolic syndrome, diabetes, amongst our people. And he was saying that 20 years ago, 30 years ago, that we needed to get really organised on this one. And it is obviously cutting a swathe through our people. Diabetes is cutting a swathe throughout our communities. That is why the number four is in front of the age of all of our people who are, um, we're seeing to an early grave. So I don't think I don't have any sense that we are on top of this problem. 
and I suspect that this this problem is going to um, uh, really mm. balloon in the future with our young people if we if we don't have a way of closing the gap on our diabetes problem. Well, no. Then we're going to see um, this continue. No, the minister sitting next to you, and I want to ask you, minister. As the minister responsible for this and seeing this, you see this in your own travels. What's the government doing? Well, again, if I can just reflect briefly on Dr. G. Unipingu, I spent some time with him where he lived. He's a man, whilst not having sight, had he was just a wonderful guy. He'd get around the community, a happy man, a happy community. But he needed dialysis on one of the remote outstations on the very, very top end of Elko Island. So it doesn't matter how wealthy you are or how wealthy you aren't, if you have to move away from your family and community to get a basic service, it's never going to be. So if you have to live in Darwin, if you have to live next to a hospital, which is very expensive, and it's away from your entire support group, these are the sort of circumstances under which this tragedy occurred. So it's not only the provision of service, it's a sophisticated provision of service. Uh, I think we're doing reasonably well in terms of infrastructure, but it's where it is. And it's also ensuring, instead of saying we've got a problem with, with, with nursing and medical staff, it's about training the people who live there in those communities. That's got to be the solution. We understand that, and I have to say, we've, uh, uh, the relationship between the states and territories in this regard is excellent. It's one of those areas they're working very, very closely together. Yeah. But, but I just say, but I agree entirely that there is this tsunami uh, it, it has to be seen like that. This is happening at a geometric rate of progression. This is not something we can just fiddle with. We have to have a more significant answer than we have now. At this point, I, I want to also remember the sad passing of Mrs Gurwiwi, who sat on this very panel here at Q&A at Gama three years ago, and like Dr Yunapingu, died much too young. I want to pay respects to her tonight. Our next question comes from Bandak Marika. Good evening, everyone on the panel. Um, my question is directed to you, Piriu. Um, as an artist, as a land carer, as a land management, as a, a person who actually uh, thinks about <coughs> what does um, fake art mean to Australians, both non-Indigenous and Indigenous. How do you feel when you see or find an image of an art that carries or, or misrepresents the integral part of the story that the Aboriginal design um, displays or portrays through trying to educate um, non-Indigenous um, people about the uh, connections to Aboriginal people in our country um, and the sacredness of those art that is um, misrepresentative to um, an unknown eye of uh, persons who's misusing um, our art, our Indigenous art, which, um, and you see it um, knowing that you've been told all your life by your older generations, your family, that who you are, this is your country, this is your boundary, this is the art for it. Um, and the sacredness that those art carries and the heritage values in Indigenous, indigenous culture, the heritage values upon that country um, is then misused and misrepresented in Australia, um, and what what can we do or what can we say to have the institute, the government, um, to educate non-Indigenous people in, or anyone else about misusing or fake arts? So, Peter, the question broadly, what can we do about fake art? But more specifically as well, have you experienced this? You've seen a sacred representation being misused in art, incorrectly, uh, inappropriately. Well, it's a long time since I've been directly involved in the arts area. I used to be the uh, member for the, um, on the Aboriginal Arts Council and the Australia Council some years ago, and 
uh, I worked with help setting up uh, most of the art centres in uh, in the Kimberleys as, as well as uh, Anchor. And the whole purpose of um, the participation and drive for that is exactly um, to address the issue that Bundak has has uh, raised. I mean, I um, my first contact with such um, activity is, is is driven by obvious outrage. I mean, the whole uh, level of ownership and interconnectedness and the kind of sense of meaning uh, in the representation of the art itself, um, not just to the particular artist itself, but also the clan or the group and its relevancy to uh, people's beliefs and cultural systems. It's, uh, uh, I think, the the, the, the the nature of the insensitivity, but I think that, uh, in my view, it should be deemed to be criminal behaviour. Um, now, I don't, can't refer to any particular kind of uh, legislation mm. or, or, or maybe the minister can do that mm. to tell you where the, we can address that. But certainly, I think, uh, critically, what's important is the on-the-ground support for the art centres and the artists themselves, that they're empowered uh, to be able to um, monitor and to be vigilant about the nature of the misuse of that art. I think there's a huge education re um, required, but there will obviously be people who um, will conduct themselves in that behaviour. Uh, we just have to ensure that uh, we work closely with the uh, the government and the other authorities uh, who have the authority to be able to deal with this. I know, Marcia, you, you want to say something, but if I could um, just quickly get a response from you, Denise, and maybe you, Jabri, as well, about the need to protect heritage and art. Jabri? I think it's really, really important that the image of art within Indigenous culture is protected, not as in art organisations, but individual Aboriginal people where they come in contact inviting an Aboriginal person and saying, you're my brother or you're my sister. Or we say, I give you permission to do my artwork. I think that comes back to us as Aboriginal people, a Yolngu, right across Australia about getting that pride to not let go of your pride because that pride identifies and identifies you as a person, Indigenous person that have made art throughout the generation, whether they're a rock art or stone axe or bark painting, or even in the modern world, print on paper. I think it, it is rather important that we, as you all know, again, consider ourselves of what we hold as precious is never let go. I'm sure we've discussed this a lot more, but we do have a lot of questions we want to get through, so I want to sort of work through as much as we can. Our next question is coming from Jambawa Marawili. Alele. <coughs> I came all the way from Blue Mud Bay to, to visit Yerkala, and this is one of our country. The young one were at Australia went to want to create a better future for a real job and good house home for our people. The ne ne the second one, we are powerful people with a strong understanding of our land and our culture how our government and also Northern Land Council work with people from the land to build our future, a better future. 
It's a wonderful question that goes to the viability, the economic base that Indigenous peoples are looking for and the ability of governments to work with us to deliver that. This was actually discussed today, wasn't it, in our session. I, I want to go to you, Marcy, because you've, you've been part of this. You've, you've talked of a quiet revolution where Indigenous peoples are taking control of their own economic futures. Take us through that and why we don't hear more about it. Well, I know what Jumbawa is asking. He is asking why is it so difficult for Aboriginal people to uh, get the right kind of titling to have houses built in their communities. Is that correct? Mm. Yes. And uh, we heard a little bit about it today. It came up in the discussion. Mm. And it is because of the legal problems uh, with um, the Land Rights Act, um, the Section 19 leases, the township leasing, um, the housing allotment uh, scenario under that legal regime. Um, there probably should be an amendment to the Northern Territory Land Rights Act to make it easier to create housing allotments under the um, a township lease arrangement or some other lease without the traditional owners losing their underlying rights. It has been achieved in a couple of cases. It's actually been achieved at Gunyangara and uh, I think at Murujulu, but it took many, many years to negotiate because the, in the Northern Territory, the Land Rights Act is a Commonwealth Act. Um, the housing allotments are issued by the Northern Territory as a kind of state um, with its statehood powers. And, um, <clears throat> and then there's the uh, institution of the Northern Land Council that has its legal requirements. So um, the red tape involved is uh, stopping it's, play, it's, a, it's a major obstacle to people getting housing well, allotments let, and houses. Let, let, let me go to Nigel Scullion, if, you could, um, if I could ask you, please be as brief as possible so we can move on, but if you can respond directly to that. Jumbawa, wawa. I'm glad you got here from Baniella. Lovely to see you. Uh, as you know, we're in the middle of something that hasn't been done much before, and that is seeking a 99-year lease for a single housing block inside Baniella. I commend you for the work that you've done. We're working very closely with the Land Council. As you know, we've made great advances. I'd ask, I'd seek your patience. I think they're all working very hard now to try to get that achieved. Uh, but as Marsha says, as these things come to bear and we fix them, we've got to learn from that process of how we make it easier and how we make it quicker and frankly, how we make it cheaper. So the, the legal process as part of this has been quite expensive and yet, it's not a litigious process, so we need to work on those things, but thanks, mate. And just before we move on to the next question, another part of that, Denise, was the question of jobs, and you're directly involved here in this community, the question of jobs in creating viable opportunities for people on their own country. Mm. So, at the Gama Festival, um, because it's such a fabulous community-driven initiative, it is owned and directed by Indigenous people themselves. Uh, we find a natural order here in terms of people working at the security gates. You've got people delivering their own cultural activities. They're talking in their own language. They're you know, working on their own artwork and speaking about the stories associated with it. They're, they're making up their own lyrics for their own songs. Uh, more of that. I, I think is required. Um, and also I think there's an element of um, non-Indigenous people tr trying to provide a level of trust that Indigenous people can actually do this themselves, but in their own way also. Yep. Next question from Shakira Yulala Monongo. Um, as Ali earlier discussed, um, this question is to Nigel. Um, are you serious about addressing Indigenous housing, particularly overcrowded housing? Do you have any idea of the impact that this has on people's lives? Shakira, thank you for your contribution earlier today. That was really lovely. We all appreciated your words. We're, we're deadly serious about this. Uh, we've invested $5.4 billion over the last decade and 
I think everybody would agree we could have done a lot better. We have reduced overcrowding from 52% to 37%. Uh, it's still in the margins and that took a fair while to do. So the next rollout, which we are now negotiating with the states and territories about the National Partnership on Remote Indigenous Housing, uh, will be negotiating on the basis of what the communities have asked us to negotiate on. So Indigenous employment is non-negotiable. Indigenous procurement is non-negotiable. We'll be asking the states to match those funds because we need a pulse. Sometimes we can just trickle along and we'll be just catching up, just getting ahead, but we actually need a significant injection of funds. So that'll be the basis of our negotiation with the states. But those houses cannot be built by whitefellas getting off planes with nail bags. Those times have to go. Local Indigenous people maintaining their own houses, local Indigenous people building their own houses and actually uh, managing the tenancy of their own houses is the only way this is going to work. And I assure you, those are the changes I intend to make. But Marcia, you, you see the impact that this has on families. And if I could particularly address it to the impact on, on mothers and women sharing houses with massive overcrowding issues, yeah. the social impact, the physical impact as well. The overcrowding rate in the Northern Territory is extreme. Um, in the 73 Aboriginal communities, the average across the Northern Territory is, uh, I think, about eight people per room. But in some communities, it's 20 people per room. And so this is what leads to the very high infectious disease rates. Um, so scabies, for instance, um, is a contributing factor to kidney disease. That's why we have uh, kidney disease uh, at, you know, a, an alarming rate to the extent that the local medical services, the Aboriginal medical services, are using their own money to buy dialysis machines. There are only two dialysis machines in this vast region. Mm. And you can look at every social problem um, for the Indigenous communities in this part of the world, and at the bottom of, of Every problem is the problem of overcrowding in houses. Mm. So there's uh, not being able to get the kids to school, mm. um, the, uh, the white goods don't work, the plumbing doesn't work because of the overcrowding. Um, there's violence um, and stress in the households. Um, stress is a major health, health problem in, in Indigenous communities. Um, but it's, you know, the rapid spread of infectious diseases through populations because of this overcrowding um, that results directly from the, um, the poor housing situation. There's an, um, an outstanding need for 2,500 houses at a minimum just to meet uh, present needs for um, Indigenous communities in the Northern Territory. The, um, New models of uh, creating housing for the Indigenous communities are urgently needed. Um, we need to look beyond uh, the, mm. the, the previous approaches um, because so much money was wasted. Um, you the present uh, average cost of a, of a typical house in an Indigenous community is about $650,000, mm. but it can go up to a million dollars. So not many houses are going to be built unless we mm. can reduce the cost of, of housing and uh, come up with new designs. But as the Minister says, the, the biggest cost is actually imported labour. We need to um, employ local Aboriginal people and, lo and local Aboriginal companies. But I noticed today in the newspaper that the Northern Territory Government has got rid of its um, Indigenous procurement yeah. policy and its remote area procurement policy. Yeah. So I'm not hopeful that this is going to happen in the Northern Territory, Senator Scullion. Well, we'll, 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 get into, we'll, we'll have to save, save that discussion probably off I, camera. I think, but no, no, can, can I just, no, no, just quickly, respond? Just... I'm not a member of the government and their Labor government, so I'm resisting the natural temptation because I just don't think it's useful. Being fair income is useful. This isn't a problem of the Northern Territory Government. It's a problem uh, around uh, making sure this is authentic. Their issue is, as I understand, that they have found out that people are pretending to be Indigenous businesses. Mm. So there's a bit of a catastrophe. So I'm, I've offered them the use of uh, supply nations so we can ensure that this is authentic. And then we need to get back into the business again. Our next question from Cameron Stiff. Uh, 
Yes. Um, a new boarding school in Nolanboy was opened recently for Aboriginal students to come in from their communities to continue with their studies. Do you believe this is the way forward for bridging the gap? Noel Pearson, you, you went to boarding school. Was it a, a good experience for you? And I know that part of your program in Cape York is creating opportunities for others to go to boarding school. It was the best years of my life. Never, I'll get, never get those five years back. I enjoyed it so much. Mark Ellis sustained me. <laughs> I think thought, you dreamed of being a wallaby, didn't you, while you yeah, were there at school? Yeah, that was my fantasy, but <laughs> I really enjoyed it. It was a long way from home. I had my brother and my other brothers from the community there. Um, you know, all of the opportunity of the world opened up to us. Um, we went home every holidays. Um, you know, we had the best of both worlds. And uh, that's why I've been such a strong advocate for getting our kids out into boarding schools down south. We have them in all over Queensland. Toowoomba, Brisbane, Rockhampton, Townsville, Cairns. Um, we try to get them into those schools that will support those kids to complete year 12. And then, you know, preferably those schools that then kind of everybody's off to university or something and our kids coattail behind them. So I think boarding schools are wonderful. Mm. There's yeah. time for one last question. We're going to get a response from everyone on the panel to this. It's from Kate Alderton. Hi, everyone. Um, if the government says no to a treaty, a Makarata or a proposed Indigenous oversight body, what do Indigenous people do next? Boy, Kate, you could have saved an easier one for last, couldn't you? <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll work around the panel. Um, Noel, what do people do next if this fails? Or do we even countenance failure? Uh, I think we're on the cusp of things coming together for us in the next three to five years. But in order for all of this to come together for us, the country has got to urge the parliament to embrace some big structural changes. And the structural change here about giving a voice to our people will empower our people and in relation to our destiny. Um, I've never felt more kind of on the, with a real feeling that things are within reach. Um, but some of our agendas, um, are, we've, got to, we've got to get over the line on them and of course, constitutional reform I regard um, as crucial. People are building great things from the ground up. It needs to be complemented by some fundamental structural changes. The housing discussion, for instance, I think we're gonna get rid of social housing. We will be miserably complaining about housing as long as the paradigm is social housing and not home ownership. And you know, we'll be complaining about overcrowding and housing in 15 years' time. That's what I mean about a structural reform. Can you turn a beast like social housing upside down and make it skin in the game home ownership? Those are the kinds of structural changes that are needed in order for us to you know, grasp the opportunity that's so in we, front of we us. We do want to get around. I, I do need to ask if everyone can be as brief as possible. But, uh, Nigel, the, the question here is whether the parliament is up mm. to the challenge that the people have laid before them. Well, this isn't a matter for government, and that's a given. This is a matter for the Australian people. It's not a matter of government. It's actually, in this case, a matter for parliament. And I have to give you some comfort that uh, both Mr Short and Mr Turnbull are working very closely together on this, as are the Indigenous members of parliament. Uh, but I am very, very optimistic about this process. It's just about uh, taking the sense of Makarata is not only a word that was given us, to us by Bapaji, but it's also the process of respect for each other. You know, don't resist the temptation to just get into a, a, a bit of a punch on. This is very serious. If we consider it properly and seriously, it mm. gives us our very best chance. Denise, are you an optimist? Very much so. Uh, very much an optimist. Uh, I think there's also an element here that um, also needs to be um, taken into consideration, and that is uh, we need the help from non-Indigenous Australia too. Yeah. 
there is very much a campaign that we, uh, all of our non-Indigenous and Indigenous and <coughs> other types of multicultural Australia can help us with also. So if you can do that locally, I think that's going to go a long way. Uh, Marcia, I know we've been asked here, we've been asked here at Gama to imagine a future. When you imagine the future, what does it look like? Well, the pessimistic scenario is that um, a, a referendum is not held or even worse, a referendum is lost and Australians of the future um, will never come back to this question and with the rates of immigration um, in about 50 years time, our, our Indigenous people will be so vastly outnumbered and so in jeopardy <coughs> that the Australians of the future, all of these young people, when they grow up, will look back and say, what a lost opportunity. We now have an Australia with no Indigenous Australians. Mm. We've taken no notice of them and ended up with an Australia that is just all immigrants and the people who were here for 65,000 years or more are gone and their cultures are gone because we didn't listen to them. Is that the future that you want? P Peter, you, do you have a more optimistic outlook than that? Well, well I think following uh, Marcy's line about whether it, there is a, a referendum or not, if it's, uh, there's a successful passage through the parliament uh, and some bipartisan agreed approach to it, um, but as someone said to me, the most important day, if you had one, will be the day after the referendum, so whether it gets up or not, because uh, whatever happens, uh, there will need to be structural reform and there will be need to be change because things can't remain the same. I think uh, on a critically important issue, and I might just focus on Northern Australia at the time, mm -hmm. uh, we're a significant landholder, we shouldn't underestimate. We're the largest uh, landholding hold interest either by the Native Title Act, either by the, by the, uh, the determinations and the current claim system. So you'd have to say nearly 60, 80, maybe 90 per cent of the land will have an uh, Aboriginal interest in land. And if we put ourselves in the global situation in respect to the development in Southeast Asia and, and China and, and where the kind of northern development white paper sits, we're, we sit at a particular uh, advantageous position. Yes, we have, we're asset rich, but we're, we're cash poor. But people wanting to come and to use those land, exploit those lands, will have to talk to us. There will have to be structural reforms in terms of how we might negotiate a future relationship. So I'm actually mm. optimistic about that. Jappari, is this a battle for the future of your people, your people here specifically, to get what Gullaree Napinga has called the final settlement? I believe that the power of language comes from the tongue. And during the last two days, that has been the symbol coming from our leader, Galadwo Yunapingo. With every belief, there is a turning point where success and a brighter future for our people, not as Yolngu up Northern Territory, but around Australia mm. with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, Japri, thank you. And on that note, that is all we have time for tonight. Please thank our panel, Noel Pearson, Nigel Scullion, Denise Bowden, Japri Munangiric, Peter Yu, and Marcia Langton. And thanks also to a fantastic audience here at Gama in northeast Arnhem Land. It has been a fantastic couple of days to be here, being welcomed by such, such generous people as the people here uh, at Gama. It's been a very special Q&A, a unique audience of Gama festival goers and of course traditional owners. So please give yourselves a round of applause as well. I want to also thank the Yotha Yindi Foundation for having us here on your land and a reminder that next week Tony Jones is back hosting Q&A and he'll be joined by Tasmanian Liberal Senator Erica Betts, Labor MP and author Sam Dastyari, Anglican Minister Michael Jensen, law professor and citizenship expert Kim Rubenstein and commentator Jamila Rizvi. We'll end tonight with Yongu musician Yirma Marika and his guitarist Dan Patterson performing his song Spirit of Place for now. Across the face of the land.
their spirit moving across the face of the land calling together with a healing hand sun is rising the wind in my head this feeling grows everywhere can you feel this country i can see its face the lord of the land spirit up Father and child Singing songs, telling stories All over this land From Kimberly country Standing up so strong Feet in the earth Singing their song from the taste many years, mighty old countries to the great ocean road and the MCJ. From Sydney Upper Bridge to the Barrier Reef, all the wonders of this land are beyond belief. From Fitzroy River to the Gulf Country, from the mighty Murray River to the Murray Beach, yeah. from Paddy Thunder out to Dago Rago, from Annam Lane to well, around, can you feel this country? I can see its face. The Lord of the land, spirit of play. I can see those sisters as they cross the land, singing, dancing, laughing in the old moorland. You can change directions, you can change your mind, but you cannot change, Lord of the land. Go on, go on, go on, go on. Hey, spirit of play. 